So yes, I guess uh, with that, let us begin. Uh, good evening, everybody, or to our friends who are joining us from Japan, good morning. My name is Benjamin Pachter. I'm the Executive Director of the Japan America Society of Central Ohio. And we are honored to be able to welcome you today to a Geo Strategies in the Grassroots webinar. Um, we are very happy to be able to present to you what is sure to be uh, a timely, um, interesting, and hopefully thought-provoking uh, thought um, series of presentations and discussions about the current state of US-Japan relations, which are more than ever, perhaps, for Fasa the Law at the forefront of our minds as we are looking at major political change in the upcoming months. Uh, the Geostrategies in the Grassroots is a public affairs program that focuses on the geostrategic uh, challenges uh, faced by the US and Japan and a change in Asia. It is presented by the National Association of Japan and America Societies and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Uh, our organization, Japan America Society of Central Ohio, is a member of the network of Japan America Societies across the United States and Canada. We are based in Columbus, Ohio, uh, which if you never had the opportunity to come to Columbus, Ohio, you may be wondering why Central Ohio for Japan America Society. Well, if you travel uh, about 25 minutes northwest of uh, Columbus, you will become find the North American headquarters of manufacturing for Honda of America, North, uh, North America. Um, so um, Honda, Honda has helped build a strong U.S. relationship in Ohio. Uh, Japan is number one is the number one foreign investor in Ohio, and we are very blessed to have a strong uh, contingent of Japanese businesses, um, Japanese manufacturers and a wonderful relationship that we are excited to be able to use as a platform to present to you all this wonderful opportunity today. Um, today we are going to be receiving updates on and insights into current foreign policy trends and concerns that will impact the political and military planning of the United States and Japan. Uh, we're looking specifically, as I mentioned earlier, at uh, the impact of re recent political changes on the US-Japan relationship as well as some of the broader strategic issues in Asia today. Uh, we have with us two amazing and insightful presenters. We have, uh, first we have Dr. Kent Calder, who is director of the Edwin O. Reichauer uh, Center for East Asian Studies at John Hopkins University. And Ms. Aiko Donen, who is a special affairs commentator on international affairs and senior director at NHK World TV. And I'll be reading both of their bios shortly. Uh, we also have joining us uh, President of the National Association of Japan American Societies, Peter Kelly, who uh, will be speaking momentarily and will also be serving as a moderator of the panel discussion uh, and question and answer session uh, later. To give you a brief overview about how we were running things today, uh, following Peter's remarks, we will be moving into uh, present individual presentations, first by Dr. Calder and then by uh, Donan San. Following that, we will have a panel discussion uh, with the two of them. And then we will have some period from qu for question and answers uh, from the audience. Uh, you'll notice on your screen down in the bottom uh, toolbar of the Zoom uh, window, there is a question and answer uh, function, which you can use to ask questions um, of us. And we'll be gathering them over the course of the uh, webinar and we'll be asking them towards the end. So if I may really uh, quickly just be able to introduce our two presenters for the evening. Uh, our first presenter is going to be Dr. Kent Calder, again, who I mentioned is director of the Edwin O. Reichauer Center for East Asian Studies at John Hopkins University. Uh, he had previously served as vice dean for faculty affairs and international research co cooperation at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced uh, International Studies from 2018 to 2020 and as Director of Asia Programs from 2016 to 2018. Before arriving to Johns Hopkins in 2003, uh, Dr. Calder served as Special Advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to Japan, uh, Japan Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Professor at Princeton University, Lecturer on Government at Harvard, and uh, the first Executive Director of Harvard University's Program on U.S.-Japan Relations. Uh, in 2014, he was awarded the Order of the Rising Sun Gold Rays with, uh, neck, um, with a neck ribbon. So Dr. Calder will be our first presenter. And then we will be followed by Ms. Aiko Donen, who I, again is Special Affairs Commentator on International Affairs and Senior Director at NHK World TV. 
Uh, she concurrently presents uh, Newsline in Depth, which is a feature article on NHK World News. Uh, Ms. Donan has expertise in reporting on a wide range of global issues from hard security to human security. Uh, since April, she has also presented NHK Educational TV special series, Crisis Interviews, uh, Looking Beyond the Pandemic. Uh, Ms. Donan's co comments on developmental affairs with a focus on sustainable growth, uh, global health, gender, and education. Uh, she's a popular face on television. She's anchored uh, several key new pro pro programs such as NHK News at 9 p.m., uh, NHK World Network, and NHK Asian Voices. She's previously a correspondent based in Thailand, uh, covering ASEAN uh, um, countries exclusively with almost uh, 50 visits to Myanmar. So we are very excited to welcome presentations uh, by each of these illustrious persons to give us some insights on the current state of the US-Japan relationship. Uh, but first, I would like to turn with well, the microphone, I would say the podium normally, but now that we are virtually, I would like to turn the camera over to uh, the president of the National Association of Japan American Societies, uh, Peter Kelly. Thank you, Ben, and, uh, and welcome to the GeoStrategy and the Grassroots Series. This is the first of eight presentations in this series this year. The purpose of the series is to bring discussions about the geostrategic challenges that the United States and Japan face in Asia to audiences all around the country. Those kinds of discussions happen frequently in, in Tokyo and in Washington, DC, but our aim is to make them available to a broader audience. NAGIS, the National Association of Japan America Societies, has 38 members located all over the United States. Our members our work and our mission is to provide good Japan-related programs to our members. We have program offerings in public affairs, security, culture, youth exchange, and business. And this is, our, this is a, a series that we undertook last year with our partner, the Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Japan, to emphasize what we thought was a very important set of information that all those interested in Japan and the US should have. What are the challenges that both countries face in, in, uh, in a changing Asia? To accomplish that, we have invited for this series, eight different pairs of speakers, one each from Japan, one from, and the United States, who can bring that kind of perspective, that kind of geostrategic perspective to our audiences. And the format we have tonight is the format that will be repeated in programs to come. A, speak, a talk from each of those, followed by uh, a short discussion between the two presenters and then a Q&A session when all of you can, uh, can join in it and ask questions that you might have. The, um, we are very grateful above all to our speakers. The magic of this program is the speakers and we're very grateful to, uh, to old friend, Kent Calder for taking time from his busy schedule at Johns Hopkins and, uh, and Aiko Doden for her busy schedule on NHK to, uh, to join us. The, um, we're also welcoming an audience from Japan invited through the uh, Sasakawa Peace Foundation. So this is an audience both of Americans and of, uh, and of Japanese. And, and finally, as an introduction, I would say NAGIS offers these programs to our members on a competitive basis. There's always more demand than there is supply. And so I wanna congratulate the Japan America Society of Central Ohio for competing for this grant and being selected for it. The, uh, with that, let's, let's kick the program off. Uh, our first speaker will be, uh, will be Kent Calder, well-known uh, uh, commentator as a, a professor, but also also just a friend of the US-Japan grassroots relationship. Welcome welcome to the Grassroots Network, uh, Kent. And uh, we look forward to hearing uh, what you have to say. Well, uh, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, NAGIS does a tremendous job of uh, broadening the interest in the understanding of US-Japan relations across the country. And I must say from my days, with U.S. Embassy Tokyo, with Ambassador Mondale Foley and, and briefly Baker, I always was struck at uh, how important those broad relationships across the country are. And a real um, honor and pleasure, of course, to be here with Doden Son, one of the preeminent um, commentators on this relationship, as well as 
the broader uh, Asia Pacific relationships in Japan. Um, and I must say, I'm especially delighted to be participating vicariously. I'm actually in Washington, D.C., but uh, uh, under the auspices of uh, the Japan America Society of Central Ohio. Uh, I guess I was powerfully impressed by the importance of um, Ohio and specifically Columbus, Ohio, where this is this society is located. Uh, from my experience on the day before the 2012 uh, presidential election. By chance, I happened to be in here in Columbus. And I can still remember uh, the cheers coming from the rafters of the Ohio State Fieldhouse as Jay-Z uh, introduced President Obama, President Barack Obama, who spoke in one of his very last rallies on the penultimate day, the day before the presidential election. It was from the Ohio State Fieldhouse in, in this town, downtown Columbus. And then I got in my rent -a car and I went about a half an hour across town to the airport in Columbus to hear uh, Jack Nicklaus at the, uh, at, in a hangar at the airport in Columbus, introduced Mitt Romney, who was the Republican uh, candidate for, for president, hopscotching across the country um, en route back to, to Boston. Again, only hours before election day began. And I think this is, is really symbolic that uh, Ohio is a key state uh, in many presidential elections, it's been the key state. The phrase is Ohio, so goes the nation, of course, is a common one in American parlance. And there are many elections. Uh, 2004, for example, comes to mind when Ohio really was decisive. And I think in 2012, it was decisive. It was important this time, although, of course, uh, incongruously and somewhat unusually, Ohio uh, came down in support of President Trump and then uh, Joe Biden won the presidential election. But as always, Ohio is right in the middle of things. The Middle West was crucial in the results of this election and thinking about the election and also about the future of US-Japan relations from the vantage point of central Ohio seems to me a very, very appropriate uh, thing to do uh, for, and I, I see that we have many Japanese uh, participants as well, perhaps particularly for them, I think it's worth reminding ourselves generally of the nature of the configuration of this, uh, uh, this last election of this victory by uh, Joe Biden in the presidential election. In terms of the popular vote, his victory was relatively substantial at uh, a little over 5 million uh, votes or cl roughly close to 4% of the total. Uh, in electoral votes as well, in the end, with 306 electoral to 232 for uh, President Trump, it also was uh, reasonably substantial, it, the exact margin actually, uh, by which President Trump defeated Hillary Clinton the last time around. That said, the route to 306 for Biden, of course, was tortuous. There were many, many states that were uh, very, very close. There are some um, which actually involved historic changes. The state of Georgia, for example, went to the Democrats for the first time in 28 years. Arizona as well, uh, the longtime home of Senator uh, John McCain went uh, for Biden, which was uh, the first time in nearly three decades that uh, that had happened as well. So uh, some, some significant shifts along the way, as well as here in the Midwest, of course, the broad shift in places like Wisconsin and Michigan in Pennsylvania uh, toward narrow victories for uh, uh, 
president-elect Biden, but again, a very close election. I think it's worth noting, and no doubt um, these questions will be with us certainly for the next two years and, and perhaps beyond, that it was a very close election that involved a very substantial uh, uh, support for the Republicans, including in, in, in defeat, uh, President Trump. President Trump uh, received more votes than any candidate in American history has done, except for um, President, uh, including President Obama last time, but of course less than uh, uh, Vice President and now President-elect uh, Biden. So there was a very large outpouring of support uh, at other levels of government, uh, it showed itself strongly uh, for the Republicans. They gained one governorship and they have a majority there. Uh, they gained at least nine seats in the House. Um, and in the Senate, they held Democratic uh, gains to uh, a net total of one so far. Of course, two important uh, by elect uh, 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 runoff elections in, uh, in the state of Georgia that Biden took very narrowly, uh, that it will determine uh, control of the Senate. If by chance the Democrats take the Senate, that would make um, Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio, uh, chair of the, the banking committee. Uh, of course, going the other way, Senator Rob Portman, who's a Republican, will have a significant uh, role if the Republicans uh, continue to uh, uh, be the majority uh, in the Senate. Um, taken as a whole, it seems to me, and this is reflected in what we've seen in the security markets, of course, recently, where there's been a big run up since the election. I think the market and many analysts are taking this as a matter of a middle of the road Biden victory being balanced by um, Republican, likely Republican continued uh, control of the Senate and the ability to veto the more, uh, more radical um, advances uh, by the Democrats. Uh, I'm sure that issue will come up for further uh, discussion, but I guess my assessment would be that in the uh, runoffs uh, that we have coming up, that we probably will see a razor thin victory in one of the races for the Republicans and a victory for the Democrats in the other, which would create a 51-49 situation. But given the tremendous uh, mobilization of uh, grassroots support that people like uh, Stacey Abrams, the gubernatorial candidate in Georgia, uh, last in 2018 uh, have undertaken and the momentum that the Democrats now have, there is a substantial possibility that the Democrats um, may continue and take both uh, of those Senate seats, which would give them, uh, as I say, a majority. So on the political side, we're, we're at a very, at a fateful, uh, almost a critical juncture, uh, I would say, uh, after January 5th, of course, when the runoff election is held, uh, this will be uh, much clearer. Uh, but I think this is, uh, on, along certain dimensions, creates uh, a wait and see attitude uh, regarding uh, the US-Japan relationship in the very uh, short term. Uh, in the longer term, of course, we're now at the stage of uh, announcement of major uh, uh, appointments to the cabinet and sub-cabinet and uh, ambassadorships, of course, will be further down the line. My guess would be this, you know, certainly the, the top level structure has to be created before the lower levels uh, go in, um, but no doubt more acceptance of multilateralism. Many people suggest that President-elect Biden on his very first day in office will uh, recommit the United States to the COP 
uh, 21 to, uh, environmental agreement and perhaps join the world, rejoin the World Health Organization. Um, so a su support for multilateralism uh, broadly. Um, on the appointment side, will we move toward a Atlantic orientation or a Pacific orientation? I think this, uh, there are various uh, views on this point. Um, one key person in the mix, of course, is Tony Blinken, who was the uh, Deputy Secretary of State to John Kerry in uh, the Obama years, who of course knows Asia very well. Uh, he traveled to uh, Japan and to Korea many times. Uh, my recollection is at least four or five times in the latter part of the, uh, uh, the second term of President Obama to work on North Korea uh, nuclear uh, related issues. And so uh, certainly I think one would need to see um, Blinken as someone with a, a, a significant knowledge and interest in uh, Asia Pacific matters, as well as of course global matters. Um, Susan Rice, who is national security advisor, of course, to uh, President Obama is another, uh, said to be another major candidate uh, with a specialty on Africa and also more broader Atlantic relations and so on. So, um, of course, these appointments, uh, they have just begun uh, just recently with the naming of the uh, chief of staff, Ron Klain, uh, to President-elect Biden. And this week and next week, we will see uh, the cabinet uh, beginning to be uh, filled out and it'll be easier to say, uh, but my sense would be in any case of a, str a strong support for multilateralism, a willingness to think uh, more broadly and more inclusively, strong support for allies as well, less of a transactional approach to foreign policy. In other words, how, how much are you giving us and, and more to, uh, you know, what, what sort of a structure uh, will be created. Uh, moving to the question of the region, um, it seems to me that the United States in a changing Asia, as we think about this, and it also, of course, as President-elect Biden begins to look out across the Pacific, and he did uh, make several calls in the last 24 hours, I think, as many of you know, uh, presenting his notion of a secure and uh, prosperous Pacific, uh, perhaps contrasting to some extent to the rhetoric, rhetoric of the free and in, uh, an open Indo-Pacific, which the Trump administration had followed closely onto. But in any case, a, uh, as one looks, I guess, first at the region, and then coming back to the question of policy, uh, one thing that we all have to uh, remember, of course, is the, the sweeping impact that COVID-19 has had globally. Of course, here in the United States with close to 250,000 fatalities and over 11,000 people uh, inflicted and particularly in the middle part of our country, of course, the uh, number of infections increasing rapidly. Um, the imprint of COVID across the Pacific and within the Pacific is certainly something uh, to be conscious of. And as a faculty member, of course, at Johns Hopkins University, uh, which has been very uh, following this closely, I'm, it certainly is something that concerns us. Um, regarding the geopolitical implications of that, it seems to me one thing in the back of our minds to remember is that although, and of course, it appears to have originated from China, and China was much quicker to introduce domestic controls on travel uh, than it was on international uh, controls overseas. And COVID, of course, spread uh, to the world very rapidly. So that's certainly one issue that no doubt concerns 
many countries and, uh, and citizens throughout the world. But whatever the origins of the virus, uh, it's also true that China began, appears to have begun to come out much earlier in its economy to have been begun to grow more rapidly than in the case of any other major nation. The one major nation of the G20, which is in positive growth for the year uh, 2020 is clearly China. Korea has been doing relatively well and may be in that uh, category also. Vietnam, of course, has done well. Some countries in the Pacific, in Indo-Pacific, particularly India, have been badly hit. India's GDP expected to be perhaps declining 10% uh, this year. And so uh, the effects have been different across the region, but in the background of our discussion of the geopolitical impact, I think realizing that uh, COVID has hit some countries uh, such as India and of course the United States much harder than it has hit others such as China. Um, now, what does all of this mean in terms of the evolution of the region? There are two broad developments, it seems to me, that we're thinking about, and I'm sure that uh, we will uh, hear in our, uh, I look forward to Doug and Son's comments and certainly to our Q&A thereafter. Um, how important these two uh, relatively will be, I think is still unclear. I think we're moving toward a, an era of more broader, um, interaction across the region than in the last four years, partly because of the Biden administration likely to embrace multilateralism more strongly. Uh, but the two uh, broad competing concepts in some ways are the quad, that is to say the quadrilateral relationship of the US, Japan, um, India, and Japan, the US, uh, Japan, India, and Australia, I'm sorry. And then uh, RCEP, the new uh, trade agreement among 15 nations of the Pacific, not including either the United States or India. That was just uh, completed this last weekend, uh, but involving 2.2 billion people, uh, GDP of the whole group of over 26, uh, trillion uh, dollars. And so it's a, a huge new uh, trading uh, arrangement that uh, the Biden administration will have to be looking at. Um, my sense of these two, certainly the quad, uh, which had, okay, the quad is so far has been um, much more of a military uh, type organization. It held its first uh, uh, summit, uh, foreign ministers meeting, I should say, uh, two plus two, uh, that is to say the foreign ministers and the defense ministers or the secretaries of state and defense um, in last month in Tokyo. And then its first military exercises, the Malabar exercises uh, just in uh, the last few days um, the communication, particularly since last June, among these four has intensified uh, quite rapidly. Uh, Deputy Secretary of State Began has been having uh, weekly webinar uh, sessions with his counterparts in the other three. Um, Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Morrison of Australia had an important summit in June. Uh, new arrangements for dispatching Indian forces to Australian bases within range of the South China Sea. Um, so a number of developments on the security side, and I think it's fair to say probably more uh, uh, a serious momentum, especially on the part of Australia and the United States and um, India than has previously uh, been the case. 
I'll be very interested in what Dodin Sun has to say about Japan in relation to this, I guess, particularly with the transition from Prime Minister Abe to uh, Prime Minister Suga, many wonder if uh, Japan will uh, be perhaps more oriented toward the human security or toward the non-military side rather than a very strongly uh, military oriented, um, so close to alliance type relationship. As in some ways the Trump administration I think was pushing for. Uh, my guess is that Biden in terms of his orientation, certainly with people like uh, Tony Blinken in some important roles, they'll be very concerned about national security, but perhaps not with such an exclusive security focus, which leads me to the other grouping that Biden will need to think about uh, and which uh, really suggests Chinese leverage and uh, the importance uh, for the United States of uh, coming up with serious uh, economic proposals to uh, countervail uh, what has developed in a certain sense in a pro, I wouldn't say pro-Chinese way, that's overly uh, um, probably exaggerates the matter, but certainly in an arrangement that's more favorable to the uh, participants within Asia than it is to the American uh, uh, side. Uh, under the, as I mentioned, the uh, United States and India, neither of those two uh, large countries are members of uh, the RCEP arrangement. Um, now, of course, the United, it was the United States that pulled out of TPP in 2017 on President Trump's first day in office. And uh, he, his reason, of course, was that uh, the playing field was uneven, that this was giving too many advantages to uh, the other partners, trading partners, and didn't provide sufficiently for uh, American economic interests. Um, as a consequence, of course, a new dynamic began to uh, come to play across the Pacific. Japan um, rather adroitly pulled the CPTPP arrangement. The other participants in the TPP minus the United States together. But of course, many of the interests that the United States pushed for under President Obama, including some of the environmental and labor uh, provisions that Senator uh, Brown and others uh, had pushed for were uh, not included in the agreement that came about after uh, President, as the successor after the United States left. So uh, in any case, I think it's fair to say that the RCEP arrangement is not as high quality in the sense of including strict standards for intellectual property and um, uh, service, service trade, uh, many of the things that would actually favor the United States as uh, would otherwise have happened under the TPP. Um, but an agreement has been achieved that is going to uh, accelerate a production, manufacturing production chains within Asia. And so it may create new challenges for American uh, manufacturers in breaking into uh, Asian markets. So uh, President, elect Biden has said he will deal with domestic issues first, but there's going to be new pressures just because of the structure of RCEP on the United States to uh, move to secure uh, markets in Asia. And of course, in many areas, if you take uh, construction equipment, if you take aircraft, if you take engines, you know, uh, many companies from Ohio itself, uh, Cummins Engine and so on, there are in, in Ohio, there are many exporting interests, I'm sure that will be concerned about this sort of issue. Um, I don't want to go on too long. I have to say, I, I look forward to uh, first, of course, to, Dowd and Son's comments on what's happening in Japan in response to these 
a broad new forces of uh, the Quad and RCEP and American politics that are coming, and then also uh, to our discussion. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Kent. That was a that was a, uh, a very effective summary of a complex American uh, electoral process. But mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you also point out uh, uh, something for all of us to think about, which is as the uh, incoming Biden administration discusses multilateralism in Asia, structurally there is there are two concepts that you that you mentioned: the Quad and uh, and RCEP, which will present challenges. To, uh, to for the administration to come up with a quick response to. Mm -hmm. I think so. Our second uh, speaker is, uh, is uh, Aiko Doden, whom Ben has, uh, is, has introduced. She's fresh from the TV studio at, at, at NHK. This is uh, Doden-san's second visit to a, uh, to a Japan America society. And, and uh, Aiko, your previous uh, host, Teresa Kalzak of the Japan America Society of Indiana, I think is one of the viewers tonight, so you can say hello to her. But we, uh, we welcome uh, Aiko Doden to, uh, to the Geostrategy and the Grassroots Program. Doden-san. Thank you. Um, good morning from Tokyo uh, and, and good evening to, to those of you in the United States. Um, I'd like to first of all thank Japan America Society of Central Ohio in Columbus and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation for inviting me to this geostrategy in the grassroots webinar. And it is of course an honor for me to take part in this event with Dr. Calder, who is the leading scholar on virtually everything about US-Japan relations and US-Asia policy. Um, Dr. Calder, because you give so many speeches and lectures worldwide, you might not remember, but um, those of us in Japan remember very vividly about um, the speech um, you gave in Tokyo um, before the previous uh, presidential election in which you articulated on the need for us to focus on, pay attention to the, the Rust Belt um, in the United States. Um, and, and promoted our um, understanding on how to um, in sort of analyze the, the changes that were happening in the changes that were about to take place in the United States. And, and I believe um, as Dr. Calder elaborated then, um, I believe grassroots exchanges matter in nurturing trust and maintaining relations between the two countries. And I, so I like the fact that this event was titled Geostrategy in the Grassroot. Um, about a week or so ago, Dr. Calder and I had a provisional Zoom meeting with Ben and Peter, and we both asked what uh, events we were to take part if this was a real seminar in Ohio. Uh, we were told that there possibly would have been seminars at universities or meetings with the business community and so on. And I must say, it is a great pity that we won't uh, be and actually be able to get to meet the participants in person, well, at least for now because of the uh, COVID-19. Now, as a journalist, I know that the reality is in the people on the ground and that is where it makes sense to take the pulse of the situation but I equally look forward to lively conversation on issues that matter for both Japan and the US in looking ahead into the future. Um, assignment um, I had from Ben and Peter was to talk about the political changes in the US and Japan um, with a sense of impact of change and things that need to, that, that, and, and on the things that need attention. Um, it, it is not easy. Nothing is spared from the impact of the coronavirus, uh, both in Japan and the United States. COVID-19 measures top the list of priorities for politicians. But it's also true uh, that whether it be COVID-19 or trade or security, the durability of alliances being tested, and as um, Dr. Calder articulated in his presentation just now, we will have to pay attention to China as a variable that need to be considered in the dynamics of the US-Japan relations. Um, 
by the way, as a journalist, I must say that um, there were times when um, you had to pay attention to uh, policies articulated by Twitter. But um, journalists are hoping that uh, those days will be gone and we, will, we won't be uh, taken by surprise by those um, announcements, um, by uh, tweets coming from the, the, the White House. Well, having said that, my job today um, is to share with our participants the, the pulse of how things are seen here in Japan. And I hope to offer some perspectives on wider um, Asia Pacific or the Indo-Pacific region as well. Um, political reporters say um, a capable cabinet minister does not necessarily make a strong prime minister and they're talking about uh, Prime Minister Suga. Um, I think it is too early to project. Uh, verdict is not out yet and we will have to see. But for any prime minister, this is a difficult time. Um, you, know, you don't want to be in a position where you have to control a major pandemic. I think of ways to host a safe Olympic Games, you know, boost the economy, you know, manage sensitive bilateral relations with the neighboring countries and, and do all these things simultaneously and yet try and stay healthy yourself. Now, according to the recent NHK polls, support rate for the Suga administration currently stands at 56%, down 6% from 62% at the start of his term two months ago. The drop can be attributed to Mr. Suga's decision to reject the appointment of the six academics to the Science Council, which he has been unable to explain um, the rationale in details. Um, with regards to his foreign policy, you know, initially because of COVID-19 has made foreign travels and summit meetings almost impossible. Uh, and because fighting the virus topped the list of priorities for all leaders, the shared understanding in Japan was that a prime minister during the pandemic may not need to be seen active in foreign policy. Um, I um, skimmed through um, Mr. Suga's policy speech made uh, two months ago at the start of his office. Um, diplomacy and security came last before the conclusion, but he did give a comprehensive overview of the key issues confronting Japan, from abducting is ab abduction issue to Japan-US alliance, to, to ASEAN, to South Korea, and China to, to Olympics. Um, but during the past seven days alone, um, quite a bit has happened to Malova with regards to foreign policy. The Prime Minister Suga has had his first call with the US President elect Joe Biden, uh, attended online ASEAN summit uh, with the Southeast Asian nations leaders. Um, attended online Japan Mekon Summit, attended online East Asian Summit and RCEP meeting, and also met in person with the um, IOC, um, the International Organization of the, the Olympics uh, Chief and Australian Prime Minister who are on their official visits to Japan. And I think that all these are the elements that will shape um, U.S.-Japan, Japan-U.S. relations um, um, in the um, near future, the key agenda that will shape the bilateral relations, you know, and those elements are sort of packed nicely within the span of one week. Um, let me start with the, the security front um, and mention a, a bit about the, the Senkak Island dispute. Um, Prime Minister Suga, like his predecessor, has said that Japan-US alliance is the cornerstone for Japan's diplomacy and security, and that it is essential for the peace and prosperity of the region. Um, 
this was the the conversation. Uh, this was uh, something that was mentioned in the uh, his his first conversation with um, President Alex elect Joe Biden. And this conversation led to Joe Biden um, confirmed that Article 5 of the Japan-US Security Treaty will be applied to the defense of Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea. Um, as many of you knew, no, Article 5 stipulates that the US defends Japan should its territories come under attack. Uh, by the way, Japan controls the Senkaku Islands China and Taiwan claim them. The Japanese government maintains the islands are an inherent part of Japan's territory in terms of history and international law. Um, it says, Japan says that there is no issue of sovereignty to be resolved over them. The, the situation surrounding the islands as of early November this year has seen a record high number of days that Chinese government ships have sailed just outside Japan's territorial waters around the Senkok Islands in the East China Sea. Uh, this brought the number of um, days that Chinese government ships have sailed in the zone of the Senkok Islands this year to something like 283 days, breaking last year's record of 282 days. The figure is the highest since record keeping began in 2008. So this is considered to be quite alarming. Um, in this backdrop, um, the Tokyo's significant interpretation of um, this 10 to 15 minutes call with the president-elect Joe Biden was that um, it sent the message to the region that Biden and the administration will not ease up on China. And I also think that it is important to remember that the call took place just when key regional meetings as ASEAN summit and East Asian summit were held in the region, sending a clear message, not just to China, but to the governments in the uh, Indo-Pacific. And China's reaction, as you might know, was that um, Japan-US security treaty was a product of the Cold War and that it should not undermine the interest of any third party nor jeopardize the regional stability. Um, Dr. Calder in his presentation mentioned that uh, we are entering the era of broader interaction across the region and he um, articulated on the two arrangements that, that is um, taking place in the region. One is Quad and uh, RCEP. Um, I'd like to mention a bit about um, RCEP uh, on the trade side in terms of how institution building is taking place in the region. Um, the RCEP or the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is a free trade agreement concluded between 15 countries in the Indo-Pacific. That is to say 10 ASEAN countries plus Japan, China, South Korea, New Zealand and Australia. And um, I would say perhaps the fallout of COVID-19 nudged the trading partners into finalizing the deal given the future benefits gained from cuts to tariffs and trade barriers. The arrangement aims to facilitate market access for goods and services and hopes to attract foreign companies eager to enter a more integrated ASEAN market of more than 6 million people. It makes the world's largest trade pact, which covers about a third of the world's population and contributes to 30% of its GDP. If you, you might remember it, took a, a long time for the um, negotiation to, to come to a closure. The negotiations began in 2012 and took 31 rounds of negotiations. A comprehensive agreement on goods, trade and services and electronic commerce is included. And um, in, the, in the course of um, the negotiation for the benefit of reaching an agreement. The signatories have 
del deliberately left some of the sensitive issues to be discussed later, for example, um, investment and dispute settlement, and, and some uh, see this as a sort of Asian way of handling things. And China was eager to ink the deal to secure tariff-free imports from RCEP partners as it faces the um, uh, trade war, trade spat with the United States. And some analysts say uh, that TPP had, if US had signed on, was seen as the counterweight to the RCEP with China in it. And the RCEP was supposed to include India to balance out China. And conspicuous absence of the US from the RCEP and TPP or CPTPP may create, create a vacuum for China to fill and prompt Beijing to create its own narrative about America's commitment to the region. But I understand Japan's view is that these frameworks should not be seen as a zero sum. Now we will have to see if US will return to TPP and if India rejoins RCEP because such moves will significantly further impact the future dynamics in the region. Um, talking about RCEP and India, you know, India has decided to, to pull out. Um, so some say this was out of fear of being overwhelmed by cheaper factory goods from China and farm produce from Australia and New Zealand. But 15 signatories, including China, have told Delhi that the door remains open. Um, I had a chance to speak to an Indian government official on this issue, um, who stated that uh, India is very much for the globalization of trade, but does not see it will serve India's economic interest. And that because India has a trading arrangement with all of the countries, um, Delhi does not consider it as a, a loss for anyone, even if um, Delhi were not to take part in RCEP. We must remember India does have a border dispute with China, and uh, this official went on to comment that we will, quote, we will be happy to see China, which is open and transparent, follows the international rules of the game, whether it is in the sea or on the land border. Um, up till now, I have spoken with some emphasis on um, Southeast Asia or ASEAN, because I see it as a sign that Japan, in alliance with the United States, is reinforcing the free and open in the Pacific put forward by the US and Japan by engaging the region. Um, but unfortunately, I have to say that um, on the part of uh, Washington, Jakarta, or which is the sort of capital of ASEAN, the ASEAN ambassadors to ASEAN have been um, posted to, to Jakarta. Um, but under the Trump administration, um, that the seat has been vacant. So uh, I personally look forward to, to seeing um, who will um, fill that seat that has remained vacant for some years. And um, countries in the region do look forward to um, having more uh, US presence in the regional meetings like um, um, East Asian Summit, um, where um, Washington was often um, seen uh, not, not um, taking part in those um, major um, Southeast Asian gatherings uh, taking place in the region. Um, I'd like to comment a bit about ASEAN and China. Now, China um, is seen to be stepping up efforts to strengthening ties. Now, ASEAN has become China's big, biggest trade partner between January and September this year. The transaction with ASEAN accounted for almost 15% of China's trade. The increase attributed to more Chinese firms opening business in ASEAN countries against the backdrop of China's BRI. Um, Chinese Foreign Minister Wan Yi visited ASEAN nations, including Thailand, Malaysia, Laos, and Cambodia, while Japanese Prime Minister Suga visited Vietnam and Indonesia. 
analysts say Beijing appears to be trying to win over ASEAN member states to further boost its international presence as it stands odds with the US and as it tries to promote um, its um, infrastructure project uh, in China's BRB Belt and Road Initiative. Um, Suga also says that the Japan will step up its support for the ASEAN members to establish rule of law. But I must say, um, the freedom of the FOIP, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific, was often um, mostly about freedom of navigation and, and free trade, and, and less about perhaps values like freedom and democracy for human security. Although um, allies, um, Japan and US, reiterate that the um, FOIP, the freedom, free and free and open in the Pacific, is about um, sort of a broadly um, alliance of um, countries who share uh, values. Um, and I think this is where uh, Japan could do more, for example, to do more to encourage democratic governance, for example, or support nascent or failing democracies in the region, like uh, Thailand or Cambodia or Myanmar. Um, in, term, in terms of Japan's effort to engage the region, uh, we are seeing uh, Japan's um, International Cooperation Agency export of export quality infrastructure or strengthening supply chains or provide some uh, capacity development of legal and judicial systems. And I believe that this is the arena where J Japan would be able to play a bigger role um, in the context of advancing um, the free and open in the Pacific as well. So um, if Biden administration is to highlight such values as human rights and democracy in its approach to the region, this could also be an arena where Japan and the US can put in joint effort to constructively lead in engaging the Indo-Pacific. Um, and I think I shall stop here and look, look forward to um, the questions and answers. answers. Thank you. Thank you, Dodan-san. That's a, uh, a very interesting summary. A couple of things that stood out to me was were your, your points about how um, interested Japan is in understanding whether there will be changes from the new US administration, particularly in relation to the free and open Indo-Pacific. Japan is confronted with a series of decisions uh, in, uh, in relation to both security, but also um, also the regional uh, structures in, in Asia, how to approach ASEAN, how to approach RCEP. And I think another point uh, that you made was the importance of economics. The, uh, the, uh, the, the fact that the RCEP is, uh, agreement is taking place at the same time as the first quad military exercise is, is kind of an interesting way of thinking about uh, both of those challenges. The, um, what we will do now is, uh, at this point is let's, uh, I want everybody to start thinking about your questions because we will, we will open the floor to you in a few minutes. So be, uh, be thinking about that. And the way you can ask the questions is through the chat function on your screen. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. We have uh, a, little, a little less than a half an hour left. Um, let, me, let me start off though with, with uh, just two questions. And I'd like to get a dialogue going between uh, Doden San and, uh, and uh, Dr. Calder. The, uh, China has been in the background as a concern in both of your presentations. The, um, could you address the, the balance that both nations must strike between working with China, but also coming up uh, being effective as a countervailing influence in Asia? How difficult is that going to be? And can the United States and Japan work together on that? Or will, those, will that be two different approaches? Um, Kent, would you like to uh, take that first? 
Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Fascinating uh, discussion so far. The balance of cooperation and conflict between China and uh, and the and the two uh, countries. First of all, I I think I would definitely say that things will probably be easier uh, in a Biden administration than they were at least in the last two years of the Trump administration, because uh, the Biden administration is going to look at uh, US-China not only transactionally and not only bilaterally, but within a global context, which opens up some important areas for cooperation. Of course, how they're balanced against uh, the more difficult questions is really crucial. But uh, to take those uh, potentially cooperative issues first, the um, COP21, environment, global environment. China is by a significant margin, the largest uh, emitter of CO2 emissions in the world today. And uh, it has recently uh, begun to get a handle on uh, its environmental problems compared, to, for example, to India, I think. The, the, there has been some significant improvement. But that said, the simple scale of the Chinese economy and the scale of coal production and use of coal and so on is so great that China is, is the largest single emitter in the world. And uh, so a global approach needs to consider that. That's one issue. Another one that I, where I think the United States and China will um, need to have uh, co cooperative discussions. They may have a conflictual element, but uh, where those discussions will can have a broader uh, global importance is relating to Iran. And of course, uh, the Iranian potential threat to Israel, nuclear weapons, the resurgence of Iranian uh, efforts in, along those lines, of course, are one danger. But the uh, agreement, of, of course, that had been made in the Obama years and that the uh, Trump administration abrogated uh, led to that issue merging once again. And I think on those two, on both uh, Iran and environment, inevitably the, the United States and China will have to have uh, significant discussions that will have a, you know, they have to cooperate to inhibit the Iranians from going forward and also to uh, reduce China's admissions. Of, um, of course, on the other side of Iran as well, um, the United States has just announced that it is sharply cutting its forces in Afghanistan, which could very well lead uh, to US withdrawal. Uh, I think uh, at least a rather turbulent situation is quite possible, which is directly on China's border. And China has not been very active in inhibiting, in stabilizing the situation in Afghanistan. Inevitably, Chinese and American interests, I think, will come on the stability side perhaps closer than they have in the past. So there's, the, there's that aspect. Of course, whether China is willing to, to pull back, uh, they have a head of steam thinking that they've gotten out of the virus more quickly. Uh, they have economic leverage. I think the fact that RCEP came together as rapidly as it does is not unrelated to the attractiveness of the Chinese market today because China's economy is the one major economy that's expanding. So um, there's got to be a security uh, dimension from an American perspective. Um, of course, the Taiwan situation is extremely delicate. Uh, how the United States handles that, uh, the United, the, of course, the Shanghai communique is the basis of US policy, uh, to, has been since Kissinger. Um, but that says basically that the United States accepts that both sides of the Taiwan Straits recognize that there's only one China. It doesn't say anything specifically about substantively about a commitment to the American position on, in that regard. And uh, well, it's a complex issue, but no doubt 
Taiwan policy is one issue that the administration will have to deal with and where broadly speaking, the interests of China, of Japan and the United States, it seems to me in terms of a stable situation across the Taiwan Straits are uh, parallel. Another important area of course is Southeast Asia. Uh, and I'm sure Dodin san is the, she's the real expert on this, but US policies have been oriented toward the security side, the uh, South China Sea and so on. Um, will there be US attention to the economic side? Is there some kind of multilateral framework, perhaps the C CPTPP, perhaps um, some, well, some sort of an economic framework, it seems to me there's going to need to be some American overtures. Uh, perhaps those could happen through the financial side. Many people feel the Asian Development Bank, which has a Japanese president, Masa Asakawa, and a, uh, of course, a strong American position as well. The Asian Development Bank uh, expanding its lending, getting into uh, human security that uh, issues like healthcare, responding to the COVID crisis, uh, those kind of things. Um, it seems to me the United States needs to think, how can it cooperate with Japan, particularly in the multilaterals, such as the ADB? Uh, in stabilizing uh, the situation and also uh, including, uh, you know, some stabilization measures uh, with China, as well as uh, emphasis on, you know, the security, the preservation of alliance security. Each, each of the areas of potential cooperation are also areas of potential lack of cooperation mm -hmm. as well. So it's uh, it's not easy to uh, uh, to delineate clearly cooperation and and, and competition. Uh, Doden San, your thoughts on the uh, on, on the same question? Yes, um, th that is precisely why uh, work is needed to to promote promote um, the cooperation and, and uh, creative thinking in improving the situation. Um, I'd like to, to comment on a few things. One is that uh, on issues on hu human rights or Hong Kong or Uyghur, um, both US and Japan have to be t taking a, a stand. And also on security issues like the, the Senkak Island issue, um, the, the countries, the, the, the alliance need to be monolithic in addressing that issue. But perhaps the difference between the US and Japan vis-a-vis -vis China is that um, Japan and China are next door neighbors. And, and like many countries, um, most of us would see that many things are made in China, uh, including the economy. So um, we, uh, that there is a need for countries to uh, try and encourage uh, China to move in to um, become a sort of responsible stakeholder, um, a, a country that um, um, goes by, um, follows the rule-based order of international um, institutions. Um, I think that is why um, RCEP is interesting in terms of how we'll um, try to meet up that challenge. Because uh, as we all know, economy is so intertwined and interdependent. Um, so some people like to see Japan-China relations as a sort of a issue of containing uh, China's rise. But for many Southeast Asian countries, uh, making a choice between uh, US or China, uh, making an either or uh, option, is not uh, very realistic because they have no choice but to, to live, try and live with both. And I think we have to take into um, consideration that that's the, the reality uh, that the region is living through. There are uh, significant expectations that you, you mentioned in, um, in Southeast Asia for both Japan and the United States 
uh, not to provoke a fight with China, but to be a form of countervailing presence, the United States and Japan in those regions. Um, any thoughts on that? Is that a, uh, is that part of that is a security question issue, but part of it is an economic presence and a diplomatic uh, presence as well. Uh, Kent, any thoughts on how yeah. the United States can- Well, I couldn't agree more that this is a, it's a combination really of the two. Um, I think U.S. forward presence in the Pacific has been a, a major stabilizing um, element of the situation, and that has prevented Northeast Asia from evolving in the way that the uh, Europe across, you know, two and a half centuries evolved into a, you know, a turbulent uh, a pattern of wars breaking out again and again. Of course, we did have the Korean War. We had, uh, you know, some wars around the periphery of Asia, uh, but no really huge conflicts. Uh, I think the alliance structure has been an element of that. But of course, looked at from the other side, and the more China grows, of course, the way it sees it sees that as well. That a structure. Uh, you know, there, there are dimensions that uh, challenge China's own sense of itself also. Now, th th there's natural conflict. I think there's no question. And you talk about countervailing presence. I think one element certainly is the forward deployed military presence. Um, but as Doden San has suggested, you know, values diplomacy uh, as well. I think that's an element. It has legitimacy. Japan and the United States as democratic nations and India and many of the Southeast Asian countries as well. They, they share uh, those va the values, the common values. Um, now, in addition in that mix, what I think I would like to add is that I think you need something that leavens the sort of zero sum character of the relations between the United States and its allies on the one hand and China on the other. And that I think is the economic. Um, this is why it, it's really too bad that the original conception of TPP leading to an RCEP and leading to a broader structure ultimately with China involved as well, that that evolution uh, didn't occur. Um, but whatever may have happened on the trade front on, in the development finance area, I think that these relations are not uh, as zero sum there's greater possibility for win-win relationships in the development finance uh, area. Um, you know, the B Belt and Road, of course, it has geopolitical implications. There may be bad debts, there's all kinds of problems, but it also potentially does have, just like all development finance programs do, a win-win between the parties. They create infrastructure, they create, you know, new opportunities economically that didn't exist before. So does the Asian Development Bank. So uh, where Japan and the U.S. have a role. So I think we need some cooperative projects between groups like China, the China-led AIIB and the um, U.S.-Japan-led uh, Asian Development Bank, you know, that can deepen uh, economic relationships to help to uh, reduce the tensions that inevitably flow from uh, both the uh, countervailing military presence and also the values diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, yes, you know, if I may add, um, so we tend to forget that uh, Southeast Asia, the region is of course a region of staggering growth, but, but it's, it is also a, a region of deepening disparity, uh, particularly um, as the region tries to live through this pandemic. So I totally agree with Dr. Calder in saying that uh, I think the norm should not be about uh, squeezing out um, China or using uh, abrasive or hostile language like um, trying, to, trying to contain China and, and so forth. And I'd like to look to the 
um, what the strength of Japan-U.S. alliance, because I do believe it's not it's not the alliance is not just about the hard security, but about um, the the softer security. Um, I might sound naive, but uh, cultural exchange sh should obviously be D1. Um, issues, areas like global health or education, uh, poverty eradication, um, capacity building of the, the people. Um, that is the, the space that both uh, Japan and the US can uh, operate. And also at the same time, strengthen the alliance that, that is already existing. Good, thank you. Well, I hope that I hope that is a uh, an answer to the question that uh, that uh, Sung Hyung Kim wrote on the uh, on on the uh, question and answer session from. Uh, and we have two other questions. Let me try and get to them. One uh, from uh, Hidemitsu Terasawa, who asks: Many Japanese companies in the United States are suffering from the executive orders to limit working visas issues issuance. Do you expect any big change in immigration policy by the new government? That's probably one for you, Kent. Well, I think first of all, the administration has to deal with COVID and it has to deal with issues that are, uh, you know, central to our uh, domestic situation. But that said, my guess is that philosophically it would believe in uh, more uh, liberal immigration policies. Uh, of course, employment in the United States, we have very high unemployment. So it would be, it, it will, I think, put those questions a little further down the line, but philosophically, I think it would uh, support uh, some liberalization. Okay. And uh, Keenan Little asks, uh, this is one for, uh, for, for you, Doden-san, on the subject of green energy, what is the Japanese government's timeline on becoming carbon neutral and subsequently carbon negative? And how has the Fukushima Daiichi disaster affected that goal? I think that's the, the question that uh, everybody is asking in Japan uh, as well. Um, many were somewhat taken by surprise when uh, Prime Minister Suga uh, declared that uh, Japan aims to go carbon neutral but without um, articulating the, the roadmap uh, towards it. So, um, you know, we have to keep an eye eyes on how the, um, the, the, the roadmap will uh, pan out, um, the reaction from the the business community um, in particular as well. But um, when we all talk about uh, trying to meet the sustainable development goals, that, that, that is something that we really have to put all our efforts in to, to reach. Um, not only because that will not only be in the interest of Japanese economy, but um, it serves the interest of the the what the, the humanity and the planet as well so um i myself am um, eager to looking forward to um covering um, how the government will elaborate uh, further what it plans to do and what timeline they have in mind that's a um that's an issue with with many ramifications one of which in the uh, in the central ohio and then western pennsylvania uh, region is the importance of natural gas and natural gas exports to Japan, which have which are uh, have currently been growing also from Texas. So there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of work to do in the uh, in the reduction of carbon, uh, both both in the short term and the long term. Um, we have time. We I noticed that we have two words that haven't been mentioned, or at least if they have only only uh, parenthetically in the discussion to date are Russia and Korea. The, uh, any, uh, any thoughts uh, from, uh, from both of you on the, um, the outlook? Uh, Prime Minister Abe made a tremendous efforts to, to try to forge a relationship with President Putin and Russia regarding the Northern Islands. And of course the situation in North Korea has, 
has un, under the Trump administration has has um, been interesting, shall we say, in terms of the approaches to North Korea. Any uh, any thoughts from uh, both of you on how much of an issue you think those two will be? Do you, Aiko, do you have a thought? I, I have some, but please, if, if you have something. Well, um, I, I don't have uh, much to say about Russia because unfortunately I'm not an expert on that issue, but about um, the Korean Peninsula, um, you know, we, we do have to, to be in, in um, a close uh, alliance with the, the US in, in, the, in our effort to solve the abduction issue. Uh, and um, that also requires um, having a South Korea uh, come on board as well. Um, with the, the, what, the Trump Kim summit that took place, there was a sense of euphoria at one point, but that uh, produced almost um, zero um, result. Um, abduction issue is a human rights issue and uh, we look to uh, Washington to, um, to work closely with Japan on that issue. But, uh, and about South Korea, um, Japan-South Korea relationship is said to be at the lowest. But I'd like to, to draw your attention to um, some of the sort of the grassroots project that is taking place. Um, I, I myself am not an uh, expert on the uh, entertainment business, but um, there is a sort of a, the, the girls group called Nizu. Um, they, they've been chosen from an audition of about, what, 10,000 10, um, ambitious um, girls singer. Uh, and they are announced to be taking part in the end of the year um, NHK Kohaku Song Show, which will be widely watched in Japan, but also in the region and, and beyond. Um, this was made possible by a Japan-Korea joint project through the, um, what, the survival reality sort of show called Niji Project. Niji means rainbow, and the, the name of the group is Niji Yu. You, you as in, in alphabet U, but it means you, Y O U. Mm -hmm. So, sort of jointly supporting the, uh, the, the group as well as the initiative. Um, and so, I think um, while you know, government to government relationship can be, can be quite, quite abrasive and rocky, these kind of, um, of course, this. This is not a charity. Um, it's a, you know, profit-oriented project, obviously. But um, I do hope to to see these other forms of cooperation um, in other actors um, also contribute to to improving the um, bilateral relations, which can be um, quite rocky. Okay. Kent, just a couple of minutes on those two. I know it's hard to talk about well, those. A first, of uh, first of all, I would like to pick on what uh, Do Aiko just said about the importance of other actors, non-governmental. She talked earlier about cultural exchange, health, education, cap capacity building. As a student of Edwin Reischauer, uh, of course, myself, I've always believed strongly that those sort of things all you know, in the US-Japan relationship and in these relations we're talking about more generally are so certainly crucial. We're going to have a, a turbulent um, period of transition in relations in Northeast Asia, I should say, uh, particularly. Uh, Korea was mentioned, uh, Russia were mentioned earlier, you, you mentioned those. And I don't think the uh, Biden administration will be as biased or in a sense as naively oriented toward one uh, in one party as uh, the Trump administration was. It'll be quite concerned about the stability of uh, the relationship, including the triangle of the US-Japan, of course, and not as a, a, a structural ally, but as another ally in Korea, the US-Japan uh, Korea relations, trying to stabilize those ties 
um, you know, in the end, hoping for a stable transition in Korea too, which may involve the Russians. I often thought as many of us have, I mean, the political atmosphere in Washington being what it is and the challenge in the way that Russian diplomacy has proceeded being not productive to uh, you know, constructive developments between the US and Russia, but still in the long run, somehow, if Northeast Asia is ever to achieve a, a peaceful transformation, you know, this will relate to Russia, as well as, of course, to the other parties. Um, and it will have to be much more sensitive to the threat that a, a nuclear armed North Korea, of course, presents to Japan. But it also will have to speak in here, I guess I would say, the, to the issues that Dodd and Son talked about, the cultural exchange, the non-military, dimensions in the end stability in the region is only going to come if we value those things more and i'm hopeful that the biden administration will see that thank you thank you and now our uh, it is it is uh 90 minutes our time is up let me thank our our speakers very much for uh, for joining us uh, this evening and for your insightful presentations i think we've all learned a lot and we've covered We've covered really uh, Asia from Iran all the way to Korea and, and everywhere in between and, uh, and, and during the discussion. So we appreciate that very much. I'm going to turn it back over for a, uh, for, uh, a, a sum up by, uh, by Ben Pactor. And thank you again to our funder, the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, for helping us with the geostrategy and the grassroots program as our partner. <laughs>